Here's chapter two, part two, atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. All right, the atomic number is just the number of protons. So any atom in the universe that has six protons in it is carbon. Anyone with seven is nitrogen. This is the way that we tell the difference between what atom we have, is how many protons are in the nucleus. So that's why we call it the atomic number. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Since we said previously that electrons are very, very small compared to protons and neutrons, basically all the mass is in the nucleus, and that's where the protons and neutrons are, so that's why we call it the mass number. Isotopes. They have the same atomic number, but different mass numbers, meaning they have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Let's look at it in an example. Here we have carbon. Carbon has six protons, so it's atomic number six. We write that as a uh, subscript before the chemical symbol. The mass number is protons plus neutrons, and in this case it's 12. So we know, since it's carbon, it has six protons. That must also mean, since 12 minus 6 is 6, that it has six neutrons. So carbon with a mass number of 12 has six protons and six neutrons. There's a couple other ways we can write this. We can write it as in a name form, carbon-12 or the symbol-12. There is also carbon-13. I don't know why that's so long. And carbon-14. The only difference here is carbon-13 has seven neutrons, again, six protons because it's carbon, seven neutrons, and the carbon-14 has eight neutrons. So these are, these are the isotopes of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Here are the isotopes of hydrogen. The most common one, prote proteum, it's just a proton. It's a proton usually with one electron circling it. Deuterium, if you hear about heavy water, um, some nuclear reactors are light water reactors, some are heavy water reactors. Um, this is where they have deuterium, maybe even a little bit of tritium. Tritium is very rare. There, there's a lot of neutrons there. There's two neutrons for every proton. But deuterium, this is heavy water. Um, they actually call it D2O instead of H2O, where the D represents is from the deuterium. Again, not, not very common. Uh, protium is by far the most abundant of the hydrogen isotopes. Here's a periodic table. We should um, be familiar with it. A couple groups we call by names. Group one is the alkali metals, very reactive. Group two, the alkaline earth metals, also reactive, but not as reactive as those group one elements. Those group one metals are so reactive that they're not found in nature in an uncombined state. Uncombined state meaning you're not going to walk down the street or dig somewhere and find a chunk of sodium. Sodium is very reactive. You put it in water, it'll actually explode and catch the water on fire. Very, very violent reaction. Where you could walk, you could dig, and you could find gold is AU. You could find a chunk of gold in its uncombined state, meaning it's just pure gold. Same with silver. All right, so there's group one and group two. In the middle here, those are the transition metals. Now let's look on the end. Noble gases, we know group eight. Um, why are they called the noble gases? Because they don't bond with anybody. Halogens are group seven or 17. Some periodic tables will have different numbering systems. This is seven or 17. Halogens also very reactive. They like to combine a lot with the group one and group two metals. Next, the they have group numbers, or we might call uh, group six we might call it the oxygen group because oxygen's at the top. Here's a tough one. What are we going to call group five? Okay, the nitrogen group, carbon group, and boron group. And down the bottom of our periodic table, we have our lanthanides and actinides. Uh, most of them are pretty rare. They might only have a few uses. Um, a lot of them are radioactive, so we're not going to have the, too many of those lying around. And a lot of them are synthetic, meaning they don't naturally occur. Basically, anybody above uranium, which has a higher mass number than uranium, 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, atomic number is uh, synthetic, meaning we've only created them in the labs. Um, periodic table, we can think of uh, there's metals and nonmetals. And in the middle, we have metalloids. I think it's easiest to see in this bottom periodic table. Um, so all the ones in yellow, everybody in yellow here is a metal. So the periodic table is predominantly metals. There's a lot more metals than nonmetals. Um, nonmetals we see are in green. And the metalloids, which are kind of in between, meaning they have some properties of metals, some properties of nonmetals. If we look at silicon for a minute, Silicon is shiny, like a metal, conducts electricity like a metal, but it's very brittle, like nonmetals. So it doesn't really fit into one or the other groups. So instead, it is a metalloid, meaning it has some properties in between. Now, not all periodic tables are the same in that they say which ones are metalloids and which ones aren't. Like here we see polonium is a metalloid and astatine is a nonmetal. If this were a little more legible up here, we would see the opposite. This one says polonium's not, and astatine is. What's important, um, we got our boron. We, we're going to say the ones that sit on top of the staircase. We see this staircase, which is generally there on most periodic tables, and that separates the metals from the nonmetals. Anybody on top, we're going to say are metalloids plus germanium and antimony, GE and SB. And those are our metalloids. They have properties of both metals and nonmetals.